Hello and welcome back. Um, right now we are going to have Dr. Madawa Glover um, and her fan club is sitting here watching as well. Madawa, did you know this? Uh, I'm going to introduce her to you right now. Hi there. Hi again. again. Day four, fantastic event. Congratulations. Um, today you are going to be speaking about criminalizing the smoker, correct? Yes, actually, I should have said criminalizing the smoker and vapor and anybody that uses any tobacco or non-medicinal nicotine products. Yeah, well, okay. Um, if you'll set your presentation up and we'll do it like we normally do it and I'll just moderate. Oh, okay, that's uh, window. There we go. So can you see that now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, is that as big as we can make it? Remember, we always have to make it bigger. Then I just have to make you guys smaller. Or oh, it'll only be me that's smaller. That's fine. I, th I think checking. that's, yeah. Let's see. Um, I'm asking them if they can see it. I mean, I can see it, but that isn't, you know. Uh, boy, your fan club is like Ignacio sending you hearts and everything. I don't know how Steve's going to feel about this. <laughs> um, yes, everyone can see it. All right. I will leave you to it. The floor is yours. I'll go off camera. And if you need me, you can just talk to me. So everyone, Madawa. Hi. Um, hi, all of you. You're doing such fabulous work. And thank you for joining again today to watch this presentation you know i've i've been watching and it th this is really like a huge master class that uh that we're all engaging in and the sharing of information is fabulous so a little bit more sciencey today to talk about some of the results of my research and and why i have um shifted from where i was in the past as part of tobacco control the uh, working the way I was singing from the same song sheet and it really is this aspect of it this criminalizing the smoker that I became very very concerned about and so I'm going to talk about that and I hope that Nancy's going to help keep keep an eye on the questions so you know please do ask questions as we go thank you so Again, just because all of the presentations are going to be shared, I'll just reintroduce myself. Um, I have began working in community health in 1988 in uh, Outback Victoria, Australia actually, then came home and began, did some more study and worked as a policy analyst for the Public Health Commission. I worked on tobacco control and a number of other issues, but that's really where I began to work more full time and, and have dedicated my whole you know, career since then to reducing uh, smoking related diseases and the early deaths that is associated with those. So I have now about 32 years research experience and over 150 scientific publications. And I really reached the pinnacle of academic, of my academic career uh, when, and, and reached um, the hard way, like not out of a cornflakes package. I became a professor through a, a very long process of, merit based on merit and output and promotions eventually i got to professor and then i uh, set up my own center so my disclosures i have never received any funding from any tobacco company or any vaping product company i have no commercial interest in any tobacco or nicotine products myself and just a long time ago, I did do some consultancy for pharmaceutical companies. And 
Now, my centre, I put in a researcher-initiated grant, so all my own and my team's ideas to the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World into a contested grant round they were running. And like all of my previous research, um, the, well, that was very similar to previous uh, rounds where I'd won research funding for my ideas and my projects. The um, Foundation for a Smoke-Free World is a US nonprofit 501c3 private foundation. They're, they were established with a large uh, donation and pledge of ongoing donation from Philip Morris International. But under the bylaws uh, of the state where they were established, and the pledge agreement with Philip Morris. The foundation is independent from Philip Morris uh, Control or any other tobacco company. Under the terms of my contract with the foundation, the work I do is my own and, and they don't have any editorial control over, over that. Apart from sort of, I put ideas in like everyone else has and they decide what projects they want to fund. So what I'm going to say today, the content selection, the presentation of facts, any opinions I express, they're my sole responsibility and under no circumstances shall be regarded as reflecting the positions of the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. It's very important that I, I go into this um, and give this disclosure because the people who are intent on destroying me and destroying the Foundation and anybody who takes uh, funding or, or applies for funding from the foundation. They look for and use, oh, they didn't say they were funded by the foundation. So it's uh, very important I do that. Thank you for bearing with me. Now let's get on to the topic of my talk today. And I want to talk about the slippery slope. So when I first started in policy analysis, one of the criticisms that was always sort of thrown at the Public Health Commission, who were looking at a number of top priority public health issues, anything we put forward to the government, we were accused of, oh, but it's a slippery slope. You know, where will this end? Um, you know, ne the next minute you'll be banning, you'll be doing the same thing to alcohol. Next thing you'll be doing it to this and to that. And so that was one of the um, you know, criticisms and concerns that were expressed even by members of parliament at that time. And I used to think, no, we, we're quite specific here. We are focused on reducing the um, incidence of smoking related disease and the associated premature deaths that result from that. Um, it's not about a slippery slope at all, I thought and honestly believed. But I'm sorry to say that my 30 years experience in this sector uh, and working on this, it is real <laughs> actually. The slippery slope is real. It was a valid criticism and this is actually what has happened. I hope you like this graphic. It's um, Wacker Smoker, you know the game um, at fairgrounds and festivals. So this is obviously referring to New Zealand's aspirational goal to reach 5% or below smoking prevalence by the year 2025 and and all of the different things that have been, you know, so that's a wacker smoker. And one of my studies at the moment is our Voices of the 5% study. So we we wanted to find out what, and, and we're following, it's a longitudinal study. We have 62 participants, all very diverse people, and we they had no intent to quit smoking. So these are the people who are going to be the 5%. We wanted to look at what's going to happen to them over this last few years as New Zealand pushes to 2025. Um, so this is Dawn, a quote from her, smokers are made to feel like we're lepers. Now with the no smoking in restaurants, we're all like lepers standing ar out around the skip bins at the back door. Their, um, their stories are enlightening and I encourage you to visit our website and you, you know, it would be great if smoking cessation practitioners visited our website and learned what's actually happening for people out there, you know, who don't get involved in advocacy. So 
This is a, a timeline showing the amendments to the Smoke-Free Environments Act. So New Zealand was the first country to pass a comprehensive Smoke-Free Environments Act in 1990, way before the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control was developed and then uh, and put in place, which was 2003. You can see here that uh, we've had several amendments one in 1997, we had another one in 20, 2003, another one in 2011, another one in 2016, and we've had two amendments in 2020. And I hope that that picture indicates to you that it seems to be speeding up and the, the uh, duration between amendments is reducing, so they're coming faster now. There's also been the Customs and Excise Act and many amendments to that as well. And that's the one that imposes the taxation and sets the taxation limit on tobacco. So we have we had one in 1996 uh, and there've been many more. That's important to watch. Uh, don't just watch your country smoke-free environments or whatever it's called. Uh, law. You need to also look at the customs and the laws that control the border, uh, the importation of goods and the establishment of tax on products. So that customs and excise law and the many amendments, um, one amendment, it's, things just get slipped through that people who smoke or stakeholders or advocates for vapors and people who vape uh, or other products are not looking at, but there's many things that get slipped through there, like reducing the amount you can of tobacco that you can grow for your own use, uh, and other things at the border, reducing the amount that people can bring in. So in Australia and New Zealand, if you ever come here, and I hope you do, you can only bring in uh, 50, 50 cigarettes. I hope I'm right on that. I'm pretty sure it was two, two packets or 50, 50 cigarettes. 50 cigarettes. Yeah, or 50 grams of loose tobacco. So that's been, that used to be, used to be 200, used to be able to get a carton. Uh, so that's been cut off. Another thing in there was the prevention of gifts. So uh, people are being caught out because say a whole family come in from another country and then they'll divvy up the carton of cigarettes amongst them. When you come in through our customs at the airport or wherever, they will say, is this for your own use? And some people have said, well, no, it's, it's for him. <laughs> and then it gets taken off them. So you're only allowed to bring it in for your own use. They also stopped people being able to bring it in for gifts. I think you can, it's, it's very, you know, they're basically confiscating a lot uh, of tobacco coming into the country. Every amendment does set a precedent for a following more radical step towards complete prohibition. We never, I never thought I was working on a, you know, a moralistic campaign. Um, and I didn't ever think that prohibition, you know, I used to work with people, we had in smoking and said, we always thought, no, not everyone will be able to quit. For example, somebody with uh, schizophrenia, very heavy smoking rates, among people with schizophrenia, I think it was something like 78% in Australia of people with schizophrenia smoke. So we always understood about harm reduction and that some people won't be able to stop and we need to have other options for them. The current law that's just been brought in, the Vaping Regulation Act, it, it rewrote the whole purpose of the Smoke-Free Environments Act from 1990. It's no longer about reducing death and disease. It is about denormalizing vaping and, um, and it is a sinking lid by stealth. They're not, they didn't actually say this is a sinking lid policy. Sinking lid policies seek to uh, reduce the amount of the product that will be available for sale over time to the point where it will no longer be available. Nobody, not very many people seem to understand this. Uh, it, it is a little bit of a complicated policy. It's been applied to things like um, salt and other things. I won't go more into that. Now, we what I question. Question. I'm sorry. Question. Yep. Shannon is asking, what about bringing in vaping products into New Zealand? Uh, not, not restricted at the moment. Um, there's no restriction on 
bringing in vaping products for your own use. Um, if you're bringing into sale or to sell or distribute. So when we say own use, you're also not supposed to give them away or share them around. It's for your own use. Um, yeah, so thank you for that, Shannon. So now I want to just introduce this concept of similar, it's similar to the slippery slope, but there's this wonderful Professor Green in, in the States and she wrote this fantastic paper and I do encourage you to read it, although it is an academic, she's a lawyer, I think. So her theory of poverty is what she calls legal immobility. So immobility is, you know, losing your ability to move around and do things. She said that poverty creates an abrasive interface with society and poor people are always bumping into sharp legal things. I'm going to explain this a bit, but I came up with this graphic to kind of explain it. So you have, um, you have people standing around, they're on the right side of the law, the fence is the law. So in the first top left picture, they're in the, on the right side of the law, they're not breaking any laws. And then a law changes and along come the civil servants and members of parliament and they pick that fence up and move it to the other side of where you are. And that is what has happened. And that's what is happening progressively. And it creates, in the bottom right-hand corner, is it's really almost like a, you could look at it like a gated community or, or a particular community where the law works for them. It works for them and it helps to keep them and their way of life protected and safe from those other people who are on the other side of the fence. This is just basic human nature uh, and laws are used by the elites and those who are, have dominant political dominant control to shape society for their benefit. So what's been happening with the smoke-free environments law, particularly as our you know, is our focus, but this, this theory you can apply across the board and you'll see it across many areas, is that this fence, they keep picking it up and moving it. So many people who vape, for example, or switched from smoking to vaping, have said things like, um, you know, hey, where, where's my bouquet of flowers? I, I stopped smoking, where's my reward? Now, now I shouldn't be treated like a leper anymore. I'm on the right side of the fence, so let me in, you know, let me have that job, let me have that house. And then, of course, what started to happen was the people in that gated community were like, no, 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 you don't, because they never wanted you in there in the first place. It doesn't matter whether you smoke or vape, or <laughs> they don't want particular groups of people to be in their community. So there are three ways that the law impacts, particularly on low income people. Uh, I'll have to go to my next slide because I can't quite see my notes there. So Professor Green th calls these calculated exploitation. So this is, for example, a tax revenue grab particularly a tax revenue grab that is going to, is, is aimed at a particular group of people. And gratuitous management, now this is kind of a micromanagement of people that are on the other side of the fence, laws, um, laws that are put in place to control them, to keep them out. Um, you could think of, for example, people who are, sleeping rough out on the community and on footpaths in shop window front, you know, the little alcove. And then they come along and they, they put those spikes in the concrete so people can't sleep there. Or they pass a law, um, you know, no, no sleeping rough in the city centre or something. So Micromanagement is also done through the welfare system and making people jump through hoops. Uh, for our particular topic, it assumes that people who smoke or vape 
are less responsible than the rest of the population. And many of the psychological theories underpinning tobacco control's beliefs about smoking being addictive, uh, people who smoke who can't quit are believed to have low self-esteem, are believed to uh, be less skilled, uh, have less control over their lives and all of the things that you've heard and that then, you know, carry over and they start saying that about people who vape as well. Routine neglect is where policies are put in place that really just, again, the fence, move the fence and lift the bar, the criteria for, say, entry to a job. So, for example, the New Zealand Defence Force, one of the largest employers in the country, announced that they were going to go smoke free in 2020. And when they announced it, the woman from the Defence Force in the, in the press conference, she said, and we will no longer employ anybody who smokes. They had to retract that because, well, that, you know, that law hadn't passed yet. Um, but there is no protection and under New Zealand law, there's no protection from discrimination on the basis that you might smoke. We have protection against racism and being discriminated against on the basis of your skin colour, your, you know, your sex sexuality, your religion, etc. But not if you smoke. So people can can discriminate and, you know, prevent you from getting, you know, saying, no, I won't employ you, I won't rent my house to you. Calculated exploitation. So let's just go a little bit further into this and uh, I'll give an example of how this works to affect the poor disproportionately. And what I mean there is that, well, a greater proportion of their income is going to, it's going to be a bigger loss for them than someone who's rich. People, people who have high income, okay, the price goes up, you know, but they can still afford it. But the, when people are on low income, this tax takes a lot, a greater proportion of their salary. When taxation is excessive, as happened in New Zealand, and we're a very good example of what happens when it gets to such a high level, you've now priced tobacco beyond many people who are on a low income. They can't, what that means is they can't afford to buy the tobacco and the food they need and pay the rent and pay the power bill and, and their, you know, meet their basic shelter and food needs and buy tobacco. So what this does is then it, it increases demand for cheaper product. People begin to look for cheaper product and then that increases the demand on the black market to supply it. And this is what happened in New Zealand uh, and my papers on my our study looking at the robberies of convenience stores. One of them is published and another one is due out very shortly. So this tax, the taxation here, just a bit fuzzy, but you know, the book is available to download from our center website. And here you can see that uh, how much, how much, so Māori make up, the indigenous people make up about 15% of the population are overrepresented among the lower income groups in New Zealand and tend to live in more disadvantaged areas. And for all of that and for all the lobbying about how badly off they are and something should be done, in 2018, $1 billion, Māori was spent, spent $1 billion on tobacco and 723 million of that went to the government in tobacco tax. So on the other hand, you've got the government sort of doing housing policies and we should build sort of, you know, more state owned housing for Māori and all these other schemes to lift Māori out of poverty. But they're taking 723 million uh, with the left hand, so to speak. So this report was uh, very enlightening for, I would say, New Zealand society. And um, it, I think it did contribute to the government stopping. They finished the round of tax yearly tax increases that had been put through in the law. 
and we're due to look at passing another amendment to carry that program of increasing every year, every year, uh, and they, this current government did stop that. Um, people could see it was too much, plus there were the robberies. So here you see the number of robberies that were reported in the New Zealand media, and we definitely saw this phenomenon happen. This, is, uh, this won't be all of the robberies that occurred, it's just the ones the media reported on. So we downloaded all of those and analysed those reports, and this is what happened from late 2015 after that point. There's the tax increase at that point tipped us over the edge and the black market took off. Uh, and because of our very strong border control, they, they began to steal, they have to steal internally within the country. Whereas in Australia, a lot of the black market tobacco can come down the top, through the top uh, from Asia across the channel and into the top of Australia and then down, you know, down the motorways. Similarly in America, a lot of black market, uh, movement of black market internally and in Europe. We are, we are, a, we're in the, in the sea. You know, when you have a country with land borders with others, it's much easier for the tobacco to flow and the illicit tobacco. So we saw this peak and the current government, there was an uproar, it was on national TV, the robberies that were occurring, they were violent. Over a hundred people sustained injuries, shopkeepers, um, two men lost an eye, another was like machete down his arm. They were very, very serious and it was only a matter of time before somebody was going to be killed. And so the government put measures in and that's a whole nother presentation, but uh, it's just this point of sending people to the black market. Now, if you go and buy stolen goods, that's a crime. If you participate in robbing dairies and selling stolen goods, that's a crime. And there was one woman in Christchurch, she was not a Māori, she was a white New Zealander, and she, you know, oh, this is a way to make money. So she began to uh, sell illicit tobacco and she got done. So we also began to see more people being uh, charged and and imprisoned. Um, so that's a really negative consequence of the drug war and that same strategy is now being applied to stop people smoking, put them off. Marwa, we have a question. Yes. Um, regarding the taxes, how much of that tax that was collected from Maori is actually used to help them improve their lives? Mm. Thank you, Chugga. So of the um, almost $2 billion that the government get in tax altogether, I think it is, it's, it's not tagged. It's not a tag tax. Some of the tax on alcohol is tagged um, and gambling for gambling, um, counselling services and prevention. It goes into the government's coffers for them to use however they want. It's straight out revenue with no conditions on how they want to spend it. I think last time I was looking at it about $55 million was being spent on tobacco control, including cessation services. Yep, nothing, nothing, none of it was tagged to go and help people stop smoking. So gratuitous management, we did the, uh, the exploitation one. This is the gratuitous management that Professor Green puts forward. Now this is where you increase restrictions on where people can smoke. You just keep putting in more and more and more restrictions on the smoking behavior, on where you can buy it, on what you can buy. Um, and this is Eru, who is an elderly Māori man. He says, I'm living in a council flat in a block of one person flats. I'm the youngest one here. He's like 60, I don't know, he's in his 60s. And he said, I smoke inside and yes, I'm breaking the rules. Everybody here smokes and breaks the rules. Uh, and this is important because 
Council flats are government-owned housing, rental housing or emergency housing, and, the, and their rule is no smoking inside. And some of the government-provided uh, housing, they also make it there's no smoking on the whole complex. So if somebody lives in, say, an apartment block, a mum, solo kid, three solo mum with three kids or something, and she wants to smoke, she has to go down the lift or stairs and out onto the street. So, of course, the people who live in those um, housing complexes or, or council-owned or state-owned government housing with subsidised rents are disproportionately lower-income people, and more of them, proportionately more of them, smoke. So they are being affected across the board in a number of negative ways. Many landlords ban smoking inside as well, uh, and now vaping because the Vaping Regulation Act said vaping is now banned wherever smoking is banned. And we have fairly extensive, not as extensive as Australia, but almost, uh, bans on where you can smoke. And uh, yep, so that's gratuitous management. Uh, another gratuitous management, and I really, really objected to this, uh, the other 2020 law change, which was to ban smoking, vaping, and use of a smokeless product, so like a heat not burn product or any other smokeless product, in cars when someone under the age of 18 is present. So you could, for example, have a bunch of youth in a car and they're all vaping, uh, but one of them is 17, then the 18-year-olds will could be fined $50. Uh, that comes in 28th of November. It will, it will be, they begin to police that and enact that fine. The other thing I, reason I fought this was because this was the first time we ever, find a person, an individual, because they were smoking um, or vaping. Uh, there's one other law which is about littering and if you throw a cigarette out, but that's under the littering. It's not specifically fining a person for smoking. So the whole concept we used to have that people, many people who smoked, you know, they were they were dependent on smoking and, you know, it was an addiction and some people need, couldn't, they couldn't quit. That's all gone, you know, bad luck. Um, you just, yeah. So most people agreed with banning smoking in cars. All of the debate, all of the public information said it was about banning smoking in cars when children are present. Well, it can be, as I said, it can be applied to a, a carload of youth. And in New Zealand, the, the age at which you can purchase cigarettes is 18. Um, and I think some youth look like adults, you know, like, <laughs> The other thing it did was it, it gave the police the power to pull over a vehicle or knock on the window of a parked vehicle anywhere because the law says anywhere the, a car is, is a road. If it's on a beach, if it's in a paddock, uh, if, it's, if it's in your ga garage, anywhere a car is, is a road and the police have are allowed to knock on the window. Everyone in the car has to give their name, address, age. They can be questioned. Um, so it was also introducing, I think you have it a lot in the States, is it a stop and search? Um, it was that kind of thing. Uh, it gave the police a lot more power to stop and search anyone in a vehicle anywhere in New Zealand. and. The police can always say, well, I, I thought I saw smoking or I think there were, I couldn't see if there were children in there. That's why I had to have a look. If you, if you don't comply, you don't give your name and address or, or some other way you don't comply, you can be fined. You can end up going to court. In theory, this law banning smoking in cars and, and the fines, $50 fine straight off, if you don't pay it, you could end up in court. Uh, so 
technically a person who can't pay their fines could end up in court then the fine goes up and theoretically nobody should um, nobody should end up in prison but it is possible the other thing is that people are on government welfare on a benefit they their income comes from a government benefit, then their benefit can be docked by half if they have unpaid fines. So I thought that was really, really radical, punitive, and it really did not fit with how we had been as a society and our attitude and compassion. That's all gone. So I did fight that one. And a lot of people, even in uh, tobacco control, even in harm reduction, were like, what are you doing? But it's, it's the precedent that's set. Now, the third thing in Professor Green's uh, theory is what she calls routine neglect. And this is restrictions that just make it a lot harder. And people with less income have less mobility. They you know, okay, let's say you can't buy tobacco in a corner store anymore. You can only buy tobacco in a specialist store. This is what's happened with vaping, actually. You can buy the full range of flavors in a specialist vaping store. Oh, but then there's all these restrictions that a specialist vaping store has to be a bricks and mortar store. And, and it has to have, you know, 60% of what they sell from that store has to be vaping products. So you can't set up a store in a small area, a remote or rural small town and sell anything else of, you, you know, of note to keep you going. If you can't make your living and pay all of the lease on the building and everything from vaping product primarily, you're not, you, it's not economically viable. And so people in remote and rural areas have been uh, cut off, have much less access and this would impact poor people, people on low incomes who don't have vehicles and they can't get across town to that. Um, you know, I know one solo mum and she had two little kids and, you know, the baby's sleeping and the corner dairy's just a 10 minute walk. Um, so, you know, sometimes she would leave them in the house alone, whip around the corner, get her cigarettes and milk and whatever and come back. Uh, so a lot more of that sort of thing can happen. So that's why I have a woman, you know, being, um, you, you know, this, this theory, you really bog people down. It's a way of keeping people poor, actually, locking them into poverty and unable to get out. And what I've been trying to say in New Zealand uh, for several years is that that, that that way of living, that, that living day to day financially, all of these, all of this red tape, all of these, this extra burden that people on low incomes, all of these hoops they have to jump through. You gotta book an appointment with welfare, then you gotta go there, then they might make you sit there for hours as if you have nothing else in your life to do. It's, it's incredibly oppressive and that drives smoking. So we're doing things to people to prevent them smoking, but they're being treated in so many ways, these, these three ways, and that stress that's created, that oppression is a driver of smoking. So we were, we were beginning to counteract any of the beneficial effects of some of the tobacco control policies in terms of supporting people to quit or, you know, relieving them of some of that of the drivers to smoke. So um, here's Tui, a young uh, Māori woman, and she said, th this is uh, her budget advisor, having to go, they can make you go to a budget advisor if you're on low income and on a benefit. It sort of makes me feel belittled and frowned upon, like she's saying, you smoke, but if you didn't, you could save that money, sort of thing. Like, what I feel she's saying is, I'm silly, I'm wasting my money on cigarettes, but the smoke's my treat. I need to stand outside for like five minutes in peace and have a cigarette. So Tui's a, a mum and, and we have a few people like this where that's their only break, that's all they do for them. And one woman said, you know, like 
women with you know other people will go and have their nails done or get their hair done for people on low income you know a cigarette is all they can afford to give themselves a treat or relaxation so I think this is sort of finally I wanted to bring to your attention this quote uh, from the framework convention uh, on tobacco control secretariat in a previous year so I haven't got the year there they said oh it was at COP8 at the opening of COP8 or part of COP8 we hope uh, the conference of the parties number eight will be the starting point for a wider application of the framework convention on tobacco control as an international treaty that extends beyond tobacco control to support strategies aimed also at promoting the social development goals and protecting environmental resources some of those social development goals include reducing obesity include improving health in other ways um, so what this statement was saying was that the framework convention on tobacco control their eye is on a much bigger prize their goal is to expand the scope of the framework convention on tobacco control keep that gravy train running for as long as you can extend your scope start to apply the same framework the same model the same playbook to demonize and denormalize other social problems uh, alcohol is in their sights so demonize and denormalize the recreational use of alcohol and the consumption of sugar to they believe address obesity um, that's really really worrying and back to the slippery slope and what precedent is being set the people who used to criticize us at the public health commission um you know where, where will we where will it go next you know this is a wedge the thin end of the wedge under the door i have to say in retrospect they were right and it's moved way beyond reducing death disease um, and death it's now a moral campaign pushing a particular elite groups view their way of life you know whether it's all cycling and eating salads or whatever they believe they are superior everyone should live like them and as an indigenous person i'm like oh yeah well we know what that's all about this is just extending colonization it's extending the white european western world's colonization of the rest of the world and you start with colonization you start by attacking people's beliefs and identity and their religions their the way they see themselves and you rip them down from the inside you 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 make them believe that they are less that they that they are behind you know so for example the developing world you know because they're behind us developed world people uh, so language is very important and i have one more quote here from edna who is a senior uh, pakia white new zealand woman in her i think she was 80 at the time she said i buy from the dairy that's our corner store i wouldn't dream she said i wouldn't dream of holding up the queue in the supermarket they make you feel like a scarlet woman if you're in a queue and you ask for cigarettes they have to get the supervisor over then the supervisor goes off unlocks the door disappears shuts the door behind them and there's all these people standing there thinking that bitch of a woman i can feel them judging me you stand there waiting getting redder i've never done it i wouldn't dare thank god for the corner dairy or the petrol station she said and this is how people who smoke in new zealand 
are being made to feel now. They are uh, people, they, they get dirty looks on the street. Um, you know, gosh, dent, smoking pregnant, if you're pregnant, dent, smoke in public because people will actually abuse you. They will verbally abuse you uh, in public. So it's getting pretty bad and it's got worse. So over time, things have got worse. It's getting very bad. Um, and yeah, it's not good. So I think that's all I had. Um, and it'd be great if there's any more questions or comments. Well, we do have comments. I'm back. Um, basically, to summarize it, it's, you know, they want what Chugga said is they mean they want to expand their bullying strategies to anyone that doesn't conform to the ideology. And, you know, Bloomberg funding who pushing policy based on morality as opposed to health and smokers are the first target. Yeah. Fair assessments? Well, smokers are definitely not the only target. I mean, I have done some work in, um, in obesity. I got recruited into a project with a team. Guys, that was me. I was trying to close the presentation. Hold on. I'll let her back in. Madawa needs to come back in. Can somebody get her in, please? Sorry about that. Oh, no. Can she not get back in? Hold on. There she is. Hold on. Sorry so, about that. I was trying to close the presentation and you got bounced completely. So. Oh, okay, okay. That's all right. I thought, oh no, we've been taken up. It's me. <laughs> Again. <laughs> yeah, no, this must be my fault. Me. Apologies. No. Carry on. <laughs> okay. That's a relief. <laughs> um, yeah, so I can't remember what I was saying now. We were oh, we the bullying. About, yeah. Bullying. Yep. No, so... So um, this does the same kind of things do happen to people who are who are deemed overweight. Uh, and in Australia, you know, Simon Chapman and Melanie Wakefield, who were behind the very successful um, Every Cigarette is Doing You Damage campaign, turned their attention to making the same kind of campaign targeting people who were overweight. So it, it is happening uh, to people who are overweight. They are demonized. They often have abuse, you know, get abused on the streets. Um, so in, that's in a completely different sector, but the same kinds of demonizing and, um, you know, negative portrayal and stereotyping of people who are overweight. And it's only going to get worse. Um, yeah. How do we derail that? What do we do? Well, well, again, you know, there, there's quite a strong uh, lobby, um, fat positive advocates. Um, so that, you know, there are more of them, I guess. And the other thing is that that applying that to people who are overweight is not scientifically supported. People, not everyone who is, obesity is a syndemic. It's it's not like smoking and that, you know, you could say, well, neither is alcohol. You have to have policy based on evidence of what the determinants of this outcome of this risk to health is. And you can't just say it's sugar. So in New Zealand, the National Heart Foundation used to say it was salt. Okay. So if we had campaigns for quite a long time saying, salt it's salt don't eat salt don't add salt to your food uh, don't add salt when you're cooking don't don't put salt on your meal they ran that campaign for 30 years and then just quietly took it away because it made no difference at all and i did hear on the radio i did hear one of the scientists that had been behind that uh, saying the national heart foundation have decided to end that campaign um, because there's no it didn't work because there's no evidence that it was salt. So they've turned their attention to sugar. 
And again, they're applying exactly the same thing, demonize the industry, the you know soft drink industry, uh, packaged foods, etc. So it is already happening in that area. And then I said to Ricardo, when I went to Italy um, and you know, any little patch of grass, even if it might be a medium strip and they're growing grapes, you know, it's part of, it's so part of Italy to drink wine. And I said, what are you going to do? What, what will Italy do when they come after alcohol with the framework convention type tobacco control framework? When they say, okay, now we want you to sign up to a um, framework. Well, it'll be the same group, the same secretariat. They're just going to expand and say, we're now going to start to address alcohol in the world. And he said, oh, Italy won't do it. But <laughs> I'm not so sure, you know, it's, um, yeah. Well, I mean, we have an interesting comment, couple of comments here. If the separation between the ultra rich in the middle or low income is growing and some of the ultra rich think that they are so much better that they need to control which we've covered. And then the other one, which was the, is the resistance to tobacco harm reduction, the thin edge of the wedge when it comes to marginalizing minorities and restricting choice. Can you run that by me again? Is resistance the thin end to, to, oh, yeah, to harm reduction? Yeah. Is resistance to tobacco harm reduction, the thin edge of the wedge when it comes to marginalizing minorities and restricting choice? You know, I think that uh, it's part of a bigger thing that's going on. Uh, you know, in in a, in some ways, where if we just look at smoking and vaping and what's being done to people who smoke, what's being done to people who vape, or want to act or or use snus or any of tobacco, nicotine, recreational nicotine product. If we just look at that, you know, in in some ways, we're being in our own little echo chamber. And yeah. and if you come out of that, if you look at other sectors, well, actually in public health, they're doing similar things. They're trying to pass legislation. They're trying to bring in a sugar tax. In the UK, they've already done this. I think uh, the different countries are doing different things, but there's a big push to tax sugar. Well, this is just ridiculous. I'm sorry, there are 200, over 200 sources of sweetness, natural sources, um, monk, whatever it is, um, lots of plants have sweetness in there. So which one is it? Um, if you're going to, um, you know, set a, a limit on how much sugar can be in a product, which is what they're doing with, trying to do with nicotine. Okay, you're going to do the same thing. You can say, well, sh sugar drinks, uh, fizzy drinks can only have this much sugar. Um, well, what about orange juice? Orange juice That's has a high thing. amount of sugar. Um, what mm -hmm. about, and the other thing is sugar is a food. And if you, you break down the meaning of carbohydrate, carbohydrate is a, is a complex sugar. It's, it's just, it's not about, um, it's not about, redu you know, I mean, I know they believe it's about reducing obesity, um, but they're just, there are many papers, scientific papers now arguing, we need to look at what they did to tobacco. They succeeded so well, even though there's still a billion smokers in the world. Uh, there were a billion smokers in the world when the FCTC started and they're still there. Um, yeah. But they, but all of the papers will go, oh, FCTC was such a huge success. We need to be taking from that and we need to be doing the same things. We need legislation. We need to tax the risky product or the harmful product. Yeah. Sugar is just one constituent. You know, not everyone out there just eats sugar all day. They, they don't seem to understand how people get diabetes type two, uh, that not everybody who is, has it, some of the um, excess weight is genetic. Some of it's social determinants. Some of it's that, you know, you can't afford to exercise or there's nowhere to exercise or people are too busy or, you know, it's the same, same problem, different sector, but same things going on. And that's where 
you know, that, gra that graphic I had of the moving the fence and of kind of this gated community. And now I'd just like to, you know, encourage anyone who has not seen Elysium, the movie Elysium, and, you know, I sometimes think like New Zealand is like Elysium on Earth. It's happening now where you have a move of the elite to their gated community. You know, Elysium obviously has it off world and on on the Earth um, in South Africa that was set in South Africa. But um, you have the separation and there's a bigger thing going on and we need to start understanding what they're doing within the bigger picture the big reset or whatever they want to call it the social development goals um, and then also there's there's an argument to start applying the success of the framework convention on tobacco control to um, environmental issues as they said now yeah much obliged that was very good sorry that that happened i tried to close your thing and I lost you but it wasn't you it was me okay it that's good YouTube. that's as long as you you know yeah that's right a another um I just will bring in one more point like some of you may know about the effects of nicotine on suppressing weight uh, suppressing appetite and mm -hmm. in, and increasing the metabolism so um many people in the world you, you know, experience um, benefits uh, in terms of weight control from smoking. So with the reduction of smoking, for example, in America, and there's been a scientific study estimating the contribution of the reduction in smoking prevalence to the, so here we go. I can't do it when I'm looking at myself. Smoking goes down and obesity is going up. Now, lots of things could explain that, but they estimated that 13% of the increase in the rates of obesity is due to the decrease in the rates of smoking. So there, you know, the, of course, don't smoke, you know, it's, um, and you don't have to anymore. This is the thing, people don't have to smoke anymore. They can still use nicotine via much uh, more risk-reduced ways and get some of those benefits that people experience and it is scientifically based um but yeah we do public health is doing one thing on one hand like they this it's this compartmentalization doesn't work you need to have a more holistic view across across the board okay we're going to do this here but it's going to increase a problem over here so in Australia, they banned smoking in uh, pubs and everything. And there's a recent study that showed deaths from motor vehicle crashes went up. So, yeah, more holistic view. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and your support and for being part of this and part of the audience and, yeah, and engaging. Thank you, Always a pleasure. Thank you. Now, I do, I do want to just say, please join tomorrow. That's my um, piece de resistance. I'm going to be talking about our new, um, our new course, uh, online, free online course. So I'm going to be introducing that. And I think that a number of you might be really interested in enrolling and, and being part of it. We're going to be evaluating it. I'd love, I'd love for people to help us do that. Well, excellent. Thank you, Marwa. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.